Welcome to these dramatized true encounters. In our first encounter, it starts with a sweltering July night in 2007, deep in the heart of Tennessee. The countryside lay still under a full moon, casting long shadows over Gibson County's endless fields of corn. Stringtown Road, stretching lazily between the sleepy towns of Kenton and Rutherford, held no secrets, or so it seemed. On her grandparents' farm, a 12-year-old girl and her friends were huddled in the front yard, their giggles drifting into the humid night air. They had been playing outside, savoring the freedom of summer, while the adults inside slept soundly, oblivious to the terror creeping closer. It started with a noise, faint at first, a soft rustling in the cornfield across the road. The girls ignored it at first, used to the typical sounds of nature, wind, animals, the gentle sway of crops, but soon the noises became irregular, unnatural. Corn stalks snapped like bones breaking under pressure, each crack louder than the last. The farm's three dogs, usually friendly and carefree, sat frozen, their tails tucked, hackles raised, low growls rumbling from deep in their throats. Then came the scream. It wasn't human, but it wasn't animal either. It was something primal, something ancient, a wail that seemed to come from the bowels of the earth itself. The girl stopped mid-sentence, eyes wide, hearts hammering as the scream pierced the night. And then, out of the corn, it stepped. Towering above the stalks, the creature emerged, silhouetted by the moonlight. It was seven feet tall, covered in matted dark hair, its body twisted and hunched in an unnatural posture. Long, ape-like arms swayed as it moved toward them, its gait slow, deliberate, as though it was savoring the fear it had conjured. The air thickened with tension, and the chirping of crickets ceased. Even the wind seemed to hold its breath. The girls stood frozen for a heartbeat. Then terror exploded within them. They screamed and ran, the creature's low, guttural snarl chasing them as they fled into the house, slamming the door behind them. Inside, they sat huddled, breathless, too terrified to speak of what they had seen. The dogs remained outside, still growling, as if standing guard against something that didn't belong to this world. For the rest of the night, no one slept. Years later, the girl would return to her grandparents' farm. Each visit, she would hear the same rustling in the corn, the same faint growl in the night. Whatever had emerged from the cornfield that summer night never truly left. It was a spring afternoon in 1974 when the quiet hills of Atwood, Tennessee bore witness to something dark, something lurking in the woods. A young girl, just nine years old, stood at the edge of the trees with her older brother, tossing garbage into an old oil drum for burning. The air was crisp and clear, the sun casting long golden rays across the land. As the flames began to lick at the trash, she heard it a low, guttural growl, vibrating from the depths of the woods, her breath caught in her throat, her heart skipping a beat. Turning her head toward the sound, she saw it, a massive figure, a hulking silhouette of black fur and muscle, standing at the edge of the tree line just beyond the clearing. The figure moved with a deliberate slowness, its heavy limbs swaying, its eyes locked on her as if sizing her up. She couldn't look away, paralyzed by its sheer size. Her brother hadn't seen it, not yet, but he felt the air change, felt the wrongness in the atmosphere. What was that? She whispered, her voice shaking. Her brother, eyes wide with confusion, muttered, I don't know, but we need to get out of here. Without another word, they jumped onto their scat tracker and raced back to the house, the woods seeming to close in behind them as they sped away. That night, the coon dogs howled relentlessly, their cries echoing into the eerie stillness of the evening. Something was out there. The dogs knew it, and deep down, so did she. It was no bear, no creature that belonged in these woods. She didn't have a name for it then, but she would never forget the sight of it. Its dark, fur-covered body, its strange, almost human-like form retreating into the forest. Decades later, she still lives on the same land and the memories linger. Her son, now grown, saw it too, just two days earlier. Whatever it was, it never truly left the woods. It still watches, still waits.
The summer of 1987 had been relentless in Tennessee, the oppressive heat blanketing everything in a suffocating shroud. Ruskin Cave Park, usually filled with the sounds of laughing families and the splash of creek water, had fallen eerily silent. The staff felt it too, but no one dared to speak of it. The cave had always had a strange reputation, whispered tales of old, forgotten things lurking deep beneath the earth, but until that summer, it had all been harmless legend. Late one night, in the thick darkness after the park had closed, a young girl stumbled back toward her cabin, her arms loaded with a bag of candy. She'd lingered too long in the park's gift shop, and now something was following her. She heard it first, heavy footsteps in the damp earth, too heavy to be a person, too deliberate. She quickened her pace, the sound of each step behind her matching hers growing closer. The candy bag slipped from her hand as a sudden force struck her back, hard enough to bruise. She screamed, scrambling forward, her legs like jelly beneath her. She didn't look back. By the time she reached the cabin, she was in shock. Trembling, she couldn't find the words to explain what had happened to her mother. But even as she struggled to form sentences, her mother glanced out the window and saw it. Standing in the yard, backlit by the moon, was a massive figure. Tall, hunched, and covered in coarse hair, it loomed there, watching them. Its face was a grotesque mask of wildness and rage, its eyes glowing faintly in the dim light. She almost blacked out from sheer terror. It was the size that horrified her most, the sheer impossibility of it. That summer, Ruskin Cave Park was haunted by more than just the screams. The creature's roars echoed through the trees, a sound so primal that it sent shivers up the spines of grown men. The workers avoided the area, refusing to go out after dark. The animals in the park went mad, howling and thrashing against their enclosures. The girl's bruises were proof enough for those who doubted. Something monstrous had come to Ruskin Cave that summer, and it didn't care for visitors. It was a crisp October night in 2008, just past 2.30 a.m., when the small town of Kodak, Tennessee, became the backdrop for an encounter far stranger than anything its residents could have imagined. The air was cool, the sky clear, and the only sounds were the occasional rustle of leaves in the gentle breeze. But something far more ominous was lurking just beyond the shadows that danced between the trees. The father sat upstairs, engrossed in his research, when his phone buzzed. His son, downstairs on the porch, was smoking a cigarette. He answered casually, but his son's voice was tight, fearful. Get out here right now, and bring the spotlight and the shotgun, he whispered, panic creeping into his tone. The father hurried downstairs, heart pounding, grabbing the shotgun and spotlight on his way. His son stood frozen on the porch, eyes wide with fear, staring into the thick woods behind their house. The boy was no stranger to hunting and the wilderness, but the look on his face told his father something was different tonight. Over there, by the oak tree, the boy whispered, pointing toward the dense underbrush between the sheds. His father squinted into the darkness, sweeping the spotlight over the area. At first he saw nothing just the massive oak tree standing sentinel, but then movement. Something shifted, almost imperceptibly. There, right there. The son grabbed his father's arm, jerking the spotlight toward the edge of the tree. And then they saw it. A massive figure stood half hidden behind the oak, its fur a matted blend of brown and red. It slouched forward, its body bent, arms hanging unnaturally low, almost to its knees. It was watching them its face eerily reminiscent of an ape, but its eyes, its eyes were far too knowing, far too human. The creature moved, just slightly, peeking out from behind the tree when the light flickered away, retreating when the beam swept back. It was playing a game, hiding and watching, as if toying with its prey. The father turned the light off for a few seconds, and when he flicked it back on, the creature had stepped fully out from behind the tree, staring directly at them, unblinking. For what felt like an eternity, man and beast locked eyes. Then, with a grunt, the creature turned and disappeared back into the woods, crashing through the underbrush with unnerving speed. 
The night fell silent once more, but the air remained thick with unease. The next morning, the father found tracks, footprints larger than anything he'd ever seen before, pressed into the clay near the oak tree. They never saw the creature again, but the memory of its gaze followed them long after they moved away. In the spring of 1970, just as the chill was leaving the Smoky Mountains, a couple from Sevier County took a scenic drive along Highway 441, cutting through the quiet woods near the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. They had hoped to catch a glimpse of a bear, you know, something to make the trip more exciting. What they saw instead was something neither of them would ever forget. It happened in an instant. One moment, the road ahead was clear, and the next, something tall and shadowy moved through the trees, stepping out onto the asphalt. The couple slammed on the brakes, hearts hammering as they stared at the creature crossing the road in front of them. It was tall, over seven feet, maybe more, and slender, covered in smooth, dark hair that glistened in the morning light. It walked upright, its long arms swinging as it crossed the road with unnatural speed, covering a distance of 100 feet in mere seconds. Its head seemed to emerge straight from its body, with no neck to speak of, and it never once turned to look at the car. The couple sat in stunned silence, trying to process what they had just witnessed. The creature disappeared into the bushes on the other side of the road, vanishing as quickly as it had appeared. The husband whispered to his wife, trying to convince himself that it had been a bear. But deep down, they both knew the truth. It was no bear. No creature that walked this earth could move like that, could walk like a man yet seem so entirely otherworldly. They never returned to that road again, leaving the Smoky Mountains and whatever else called those woods home far behind them. It was the winter of 1965 in Hendersonville, Tennessee, a time when the town was slowly creeping toward development. But back then, much of the land was still wild, untouched. For a group of siblings and cousins spending the weekend together, the night promised nothing more than laughter and catching up, but something far darker awaited them. They were pulling into the driveway of their sister's new home, nestled on the edge of the developing subdivision. The night was clear but cold, the stars hanging in the sky like tiny pinpricks of light. As the car's headlights swept across the driveway, the scene before them changed. The moment Leo, the brother-in-law, stopped the car, a figure loomed at the edge of the driveway. They all saw it at once. It was huge, easily eight feet tall, its body covered in thick dark hair that caught the light from the headlights. The creature was hunched over, rummaging through the trash can at the end of the driveway, its back turned to them. As soon as the lights hit it, the thing paused. Slowly, it turned its head and for a brief moment its eyes glinted in their direction before it turned again and strode away, vanishing into the darkness as if it had never been there. Leo didn't waste a second. He bolted from the car, running inside to grab his gun. The rest of them stayed frozen, watching as the creature moved, casual, unhurried, like it had no fear of them at all. It walked on two legs, tall and steady, never dropping to all fours, never running, even as it disappeared into the blackness beyond the driveway. By the time Leo returned, the thing was gone, but the evidence of its presence remained. The neighbor's dog, always barking at them from next door, was dead silent, cowering beneath the deck, too terrified to make a sound. The trash can, which had held a discarded chicken, was knocked over, its contents scattered. None of them could speak for a long moment. The encounter had left them shaken, unable to explain what they had seen. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't anything they had ever heard of before. It was manlike. But no man could be that tall, that fast, that unnatural. Decades passed and Hendersonville changed, growing into a bustling suburban town. But those who had witnessed the creature knew that something, something terrifying and beyond explanation, had once walked among those woods. And though the landscape may have shifted, they knew that somewhere, hidden in the growing shadows of the town, the creature still lurked, waiting for the night. It was 
It was late May of 1986 when a boy named Jay and his friend ventured deep into the woods near Portland, Tennessee. The air was heavy with the promise of summer, thick and humid, clinging to their skin as they wandered further from the safety of Jay's family farm. They were just boys, excitedly gathering wood for a camp out when they noticed something strange. The dog was the first to sense it, a low growl vibrating through its chest as it refused to follow them into the forest any further. Then, Jay spotted the trees, massive oaks and pines stripped of their bark, the exposed wood gleaming unnaturally in the dim light. The branches above had been snapped, high up where no human hand could reach. The sight sent a chill through the boys. Jay, always practical, drove his knife into the ground, marking the spot so they could bring his father back later. They left the woods quickly, unnerved by the eerie silence that seemed to close in around them. While Jay went to fetch his father, his friend wandered toward the pond. The dog stayed close, still uneasy, pacing by the water's edge. The boy sat down, watching the ripples on the pond's surface, trying to shake the feeling of being watched. But the dog's growling turned into frantic barking, and when he looked up, he saw it. Standing just beyond the fence, towering over the tobacco trailers, was the figure. It was enormous, taller than the trailers, its body covered in reddish-brown hair. It stood upright, its muscular frame silhouetted against the distant trees. Its face, oh god, its face, was something between a man and a beast a grotesque combination of features that didn't belong together. It sniffed the air, its nostrils flaring before letting out a low grunt. Paralyzed by fear, the boy dropped to the ground, his heart hammering in his chest as he lay still, praying it wouldn't see him. The creature lingered for a moment, staring in his direction, then turned and lumbered back into the woods. Jay's father arrived moments later, shotgun in hand, and asked if the boy had seen anything. All he could do was point. They went to investigate and found the footprints, huge, impossible prints pressed deep into the soft dirt. Jay's father, usually a stoic man, muttered something about the cows being attacked, then led them back to the house, telling the boys not to mention anything to Jay's mother. The next day, they returned to the spot where the trees had been stripped, the knife still stuck in the earth, as if marking the place where something ancient and unnatural had come out of hiding. It was a late September evening in 2011 when an avid outdoorsman found himself camping along the Buffalo River in Perry County, Tennessee. He had spent countless nights alone in the wilderness, unafraid of the solitude that made most people uneasy. But that night was different. The wind was high, rustling the trees and sending a chill down his spine as he sat by the campfire, finishing his dinner. He decided to grab a drink from the river's edge walking toward the bank with the calm confidence of someone who had spent years in the wild. But as he approached the water, something massive splashed just beyond the shore. He paused, staring into the darkness, then another splash, this one closer, heavier. He could see the rock as it hurtled through the air, crashing into the river less than 10 yards from where he stood. Every hair on his body stood on end. Slowly, he raised his flashlight scanning the thick brush across the river. For a moment, his light caught something, two glowing eyes reflecting back at him before they vanished into the night. He fired his pistol into the air, hoping to scare off whatever was stalking him, but there was no response. No sound of movement, no fleeing animals, only the heavy, unnatural silence that followed. Heart racing, he quickly packed his gear and left, the oppressive weight of being watched following him all the way back to his truck. But he wasn't done. He returned the next morning determined to find answers. The daylight brought no comfort. The air was still heavy with something unseen. As he searched the area, he heard it again, the knocking. Three steady knocks echoing through the woods. He grabbed a piece of driftwood and knocked back. For five minutes, the knocking continued, a conversation in a language he didn't understand. And then, just as quickly as it had started, it stopped. He returned days later and found tracks by the water. Massive prints, larger than any human foot, pressed deep into the earth. Something had been there with him that night, 
something that didn't belong. And whatever it was, it was still out there, watching the riverbanks, waiting for the next unsuspecting visitor to cross its path. December of 1994 brought an unseasonably cold winter to the Hatchie River bottom, a remote and haunting area known locally as Pill Jerk. It was a place where the nights stretched on forever, the air heavy with the weight of something unseen. And it was on one of those nights that three hunters waiting for their coon dogs to strike would encounter something that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. They sat by the riverbank, the moon so bright it illuminated the field beyond the bluff like daylight. The dogs were quiet, sniffing the ground when they heard it, rustling fast behind them. They turned, eyes scanning the field and saw it, a creature silhouetted against the moonlit field. It was fast, unnaturally so, moving on two legs but dropping to all fours with terrifying agility. It crossed the field in seconds, its massive form darting through the moonlight, its dark fur rippling as it moved. It didn't stop, didn't pause, just ran. And then, as quickly as it appeared, it was gone. They sat in stunned silence, unable to comprehend what they had just seen. The creature wasn't like anything from the movies, nothing they had ever heard of. It was lean, muscular, and built for speed, its body shifting between two legs and four with unnatural grace. When it crossed the field a second time, they knew it wasn't an animal, wasn't anything normal. This thing was a hunter, a predator, and they were its prey. They left that night, the dogs silent and the night far too still. None of them ever returned to Piljerk after dark. Some things they realized were better left in the dark. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like, and share your thoughts in the comments. Your support means a lot. Thanks for helping the channel grow.